Hi folks, my name is Eric Barnett, and I'm a singer-songwriter from Charleston, South Carolina, and you're listening to Songs of the Unsung. Songs of the Unsung is a podcast where I talk to fellow singer-songwriters about their influences and their craft. On this week's episode, I have Ron Daniel. Ron is a Somerville, South Carolina-based songwriter, originally hailing from Athens, Georgia. Ron's latest album, Country Made for Kings, actually drops today, May 15th, with streaming in the next couple weeks and a CD release party scheduled for June 17th at Coastal Coffee in Somerville. Ron and I talk about the writing and recording process of this record and how it differs from his projects in the past. For more information, check out Ron's Facebook page, which is at Ron Daniel Music. Enjoy my conversation with Ron Daniel. How's it going, Ron? Thanks for coming out today. Hey, thanks for having me, Eric. Um, I, th- I think I've seen you around Somerville a few times before we formally met. I remember a couple times, maybe you drifted into, mm-hmm. at the time, Homegrown Brew House while I was playing. Yeah. And I think it was Fleming Moore that actually introduced us, or at least it was Fle- at Fleming's place. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I do remember the time at uh, Homegrown, uh, my girlfriend Kelly and I mm-hmm. looked up to see who was playing there that night. We saw you and I said, let's go, let's go see this guy. I've seen his name around and... Uh, we came out and we, uh, we really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. It was one of those things where, uh, I have a lot of people that I'm Facebook friends yet that with that I've never met yet. And I believe it was one of those where I, I think we were Facebook friends just cause we like knew people and the people we knew and, and you drifted in and I was like, I, I know who that guy is, but it's weird to just walk yeah. up to somebody and say, Hey, we're friends. Yeah. There's a lot of people in Somerville that <laughs> I think feel like I know, but I don't think I've ever had a conversation with them. Well, I'm happy to say that now Ron and I are friends. Yeah. So from Athens, Georgia originally. Yes, sir. And, uh, I, the only thing I know about Athens is what most everybody knows about Athens because one of my favorite bands from the nineties is from Athens. Yeah. But I think, uh, well, eighties and nineties, but you jetted before they ever came to be, didn't you? Um, no, um, I was... Born in Athens and spent the first few years there. Uh, My dad was in the Air Force, so we moved around. Uh, We always came back to Athens uh, for summers, for holidays. All my family's from Athens and Atlanta. And uh, so it was always my hometown, but I really didn't spend a lot of time there uh, until college. Uh, So REM uh, really got big. when I was in high school, which was, uh, I was in living in uh, Montgomery, Alabama at that time. So, but, uh, yeah, I always knew it was a, a great town for music and, uh, uh, widespread panic, even though they technically weren't from Athens, they pretty much made their bones there. So. Okay. So, uh, father in the air force, where yeah. all did you live? Uh, started out in Athens and, uh, went to Sacramento, California for, uh, like a year and a half. And I, that's when I first started having, uh, memories, uh, I guess, uh, hard memories. You know, you have little flash memories from when you're real young, but first place I remember living was, uh, Sacramento, um, and then Flagstaff, Arizona for about a year. Um, and then, um, to, um, Charleston, uh, from 74 to 80, grew up on Charleston Air Force Base. Um, then Knoxville, Tennessee for middle school, then Altus, Oklahoma for junior high. So sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, I was in middle school and or junior high. And then uh, Montgomery, Alabama for high school. So it was a, a pretty thorough tour of the South <laughs> and uh, with a start in the West. I always, I always wonder when people have military parents and they're moving all over these places it has to be hard to really establish yourself, you know, with friends and at school. And how, how yeah. did you deal with that? Um, you know, I didn't know any different. I didn't know any, any better way of doing it. And, uh, only, only af- after high school that I really start to think about that. And I think the big takeaway is, um, you don't ever really 
fit in because you're not a local. Um, and as you get to be an older kid, they find out your parents are military or, or your mom or dad's military. And from the moment they find out that you're a military kid, you're kind of on the outside of the in crowd. You're not really, I mean, you're accepted, but you're accepted like a guest. And, it comes uh, with its own baggage then. Well, you know, yeah. the kids are good and, and you, you have friends, but you don't really lay down roots. You don't really, um, you don't really fit into the community or the social network. Um, but the good side is that you never have any past that you have to live down or escape. So, sure. um, you know, uh, you can reinvent yourself every time you move. And, you know, I got better at being the person I wanted to be because I had practice doing it. And so every time we'd show up in a new town, I told people what I wanted them to know and didn't tell them the embarrassing <laughs> stuff. And as far as they knew, I was a pretty cool guy. And uh, I don't, you know, didn't stay long enough to prove them wrong. So that's a great way to look at it, man. Um, it, you definitely learn a lot more about everybody else and about different lifestyles, the more you travel and live in different places and, and in a way probably learn more about yourself Yeah, in that process. Uh, I, I really feel bad for folks that never get to experience anything other than, you know, where they were born or the a small radius around that. You know, I'm, I'm one of those folks that lived in Ohio for 35 years and then came to Charleston and, I've, I've done a decent amount of traveling in the, in the U S I haven't been abroad, but you know, seeing different people in different cultures and different, even in our own country, the vast difference in people has, has taught me a lot. Yeah. I, I liked living out in Oklahoma cause it was so radically different than the Southeast. Um, and the, you know, just the culture out there is, uh, so different and, uh, and then coming back to the Southeast for high school. Um, I was going to say, uh, I think it makes you more of a creative person because you spend a lot more time, uh, with just your nuclear family. Um, and you spend a lot more time daydreaming. Uh, -huh. uh you spend a lot more time imagining, uh, maybe where you want to settle or, what type of person you want to be or what, what kind of town you'd want, ultimately want to live in. So I think the creative process is, is, um, definitely fostered by bouncing around everywhere because, you know, you're, you're always changing and, and, you know, you, like I said earlier, you, um, you get to create yourself every time you show up in a new town, you know, it's like being an actor. It's like, well, you know, what role am I playing? Who, who, who do I want to portray myself as? Because these people don't know me at all. And right. I don't have to tell them, you know, anything, you know, embarrassing or bad or, you know, that I don't have to live down what happened in fourth grade or, you know, so, um, it, it, it makes you a little bit of an actor. It's, I think it could be a slippery slope though, because, um, you never have to face consequences for more than two to three years. Mm. So even if things do go a little south or a little bad or whatever you have an escape hatch you're you're moving in whatever a year six months and uh when you finally do settle down like like uh you know everyone has to eventually um you know that can catch up to you you can you don't have the muscles developed um to deal with longer term adversity or uh you know owning your own past more than three years starts to be hard to do um because you never had to do it so when i finally settled here in uh in somerville back in 2005 i started that process of putting down roots mm -hmm. and forming a, a reputation and uh you know seeing the same people over and over and having people know me and i didn't even know they knew me um and so it's been a it's been a, a strange interesting kind of thing awesome man um Father was a trombone player. Yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, he was really good. He was first chair in high school. He was in the Ronald McDonald Marching Band. Uh, you know, award-winning trombone player. Played in a rock band. Toured around the Southeast. Um, and uh, they played Panama City. They they uh, they kind of did the uh, 
party circuit of the Southeast. Mm -hmm. um, played a lot of spring breaks and stuff. And uh, he had what he called long hair, which was um, maybe a little bit longer than the Beatles at, at most. But but yeah, he was he was a music guy through and through. He had a awesome reel to reel um, uh, system, and uh, we always had great music in the house. Um, what were you listening to? We had a lot of classic records, uh, you name it, jazz, uh, some classical, but you know, he really, he really liked, uh, what was going on. Uh, Paul Simon, um, James Taylor, um, you know, the good stuff from the sixties and seventies, of course, the classics from the fifties. I mean, we, we had all the good stuff and, uh, you know, he, there was always good music in the house. But with all that going on, still kind of no guitar yet until college, huh? No, I um, I thought I wanted to play electric guitar. I was, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, of course, you know, I was- That's the heyday of electric oh guitar, God. yeah. I was influenced by, you know, Frampton, Jimmy Page. I mean, I, I thought that was the ultimate to be an electric lead guitar player. Well, you're not wrong. And uh, <laughs> I thought, man, that's that, that's the best instrument in the world. And then uh, I actually got an electric guitar in my hand and I realized that you had to know scales mm. and you had to put a lot of work into it and learn theory and practice a lot uh, to be a player. And uh, I said, man, you know, this is, this is a big undertaking. I don't, I don't know if I really want to do this. Uh, and then someone put an acoustic guitar in my hand and said, here, you can play a chord. And here's another chord. And, you know, if you can learn this third chord, now you know five songs. Yeah. And um, that was much more doable, much more approachable. And uh, so first year of college, a uh, guy down the hall played classical guitar and his roommate played uh, just a uh, good old acoustic uh, uh, folk type guitar. And between the two of those guys, they showed me enough to get started. Okay. I was talking with Robert Lighthouse and he was talking about, um, you know, he's taught guitar to students before and I, I had taken one guitar lesson where they tried to show me scales and all this stuff, but learning just how to play a song is such a cool feeling for somebody starting out. And if you can show them the quickest way you can show per a person a song that's when they catch the love. It's not through scales. It's not through all this theory. Although scales and theory are great. I wish yeah. I wish I paid a little bit more attention when I was in, I went to college for music, but I didn't pay attention. But yeah, just the idea that you can sit there and where you'd never, where you couldn't do it before. Now I can play a song is such a cool thing. Yeah. Well, I was uh, always a singer. I uh, sang in the church choir and uh, loved to sing. Um, and once I was able to play enough on the guitar to accompany myself singing, that's that's when the lightning hit. That's when I said, "Okay, no one's gonna no one's gonna stand next to me and play acoustic guitar for me while I sing." Yeah. But if I can learn to play this thing enough to justify singing, then. I've got to, I've got to learn more. I've got to, I've got to stay with this. So I was in love with the acoustic guitar in 1987. And, uh, of course I was lazy. Um, I, I got to a certain beginner point and said, well, you know, this is good enough. I can impress the girls with a few, few yeah. covers. And, uh, you know, if, if I'm at a party and someone puts it in my hand, I can do a little something, something. Yeah. And, you know, but what were I, some of those first few songs do you remember? Uh, the weight by the band. Yeah. Um, there were some uh, simple uh, cowboy chord versions of some Grateful Dead songs. Uh, Behind Blue Eyes by The Who. Um, those were some early, early things that I was working on. Some Jim Croce. Uh, matter of fact, um, the first time I ever put the guitar and the vocals together in front of people um, was here in Charleston uh, years later at um, a restaurant called Fonduli Yours. I don't know if it's even there anymore, but um, a buddy of mine had a gig there and he was taking a break and said, hey, you want to come up and do a couple of, you know, a couple of songs. And so I did a couple of Jim Croce songs and the owner was a 
Jim Croce nut. I, I didn't know that at the time, <laughs> but the owner just loved it and was like, oh, you got to come play here, you know? And I said, ah, that's all I know, just <laughs> those two songs, you know? But uh, I, I got snake bit um, playing in front of the uh, dining crowd at Fonduli Yours, and I wanted to be on stage so badly after that, uh, I, you know. It's a sickness, isn't it? <laughs> it's it's like getting I I call it snake bit. Um, yeah. You know, you you get that poison in you, and um, you you want it more than anything. You 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 want to be up there, performing and entertaining more than anything else. Before I do these podcasts, I always see what resources are available to to learn about the person I'm going to speak with, and just so we can ha have really good conversations, and I'm not asking real basic bones questions yeah. that you've been asked a lot. And uh, two really good places to look are, uh, there's a video you did with Mufik, yeah. um, and it was the, I believe it was the June 2019 episode, and I'm always going to put links to these in the show notes. And then there's an episode you did with my buddy Brian Dales on his show, Craft Conversations. Yeah. And uh, the two of you being veterans, that man, there's this thing that happens when two vets just go into vet speak for oh, yeah. a while. And so anybody who's interested in learning about Ron's army background, <laughs> he goes into it pretty detailed in that. And it's, he yeah. has some really, he has some really fun stories about, the uh, Lieutenant Dan episode. Yeah. Yeah. He has really good stories about, you know, his, uh, superior officers trying to get him killed by, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hoist, hoisting flags. Yeah, we got off topic on that. On uh, I, I was determined on this podcast to focus on on music and yeah. uh, not as much about me and my <laughs> whole life. Uh, but but well, I'll direct people over there, <laughs> and we'll we'll stick to the music end of things. If you can get through that whole <laughs> podcast, then I'll I will pay you ten dollars. Uh, it's it's long and drawn out and uh, rambling. Uh, and Brian is a great host, and Caleb was a great listener, and those guys were awesome. But I was determined this time to you know uh, stay on stay on point and stay focused. I do always enjoy when my podcast guests can be on Brian's and the Mufic first because that does a lot of my heavy lifting. Um, I learn a lot of things. So yeah, check those out. Also, uh, just we'll go over really quickly. You you did the college experience, yeah. yeah. Uh, Eighteen years 18 in college, years, yeah. I <laughs> six uh, six different institutions of higher learning. Eighteen years. I uh, finally did get a bachelor's from Charleston Southern, um, so I I I finished. Um, that's what counts. Yeah, as far as that goes. Yeah i I went to college myself two and a half years, and then a year at a different college. No degrees, but I will. I will say the time I spent in college was so crucial to my my upbringing that you know that's the first time I started meeting people that were differently from me and that's the I played a lot of music with a lot of people I never had a chance to play and I learned a lot of skills some of them academic most of them not yeah. um <clears throat> everybody should go to Everybody should attempt to go to a, a different school of higher learning. Go somewhere else. Leave yeah. your hometown. Go around people. Uh, and if you can do it without l losing your ass in student loans, that's also a really good way to do it. But of course, you know, that's where you learned how to play guitar and that's where you learned a lot of things. Yeah. It, looking back, it's the first week at college is where I stumbled upon you know, my life's greatest passion, which is acoustic guitar and singing. And, you know, right off the bat, I, I found two guys down the hall who were into that. And, uh, I didn't really, uh, get into it seriously till years later, but that's where it started. Definitely. And, um, uh, interesting little side note. Um, like I said, I was lazy. I didn't practice that much. I didn't, I didn't really apply myself. Um, and, uh, played that little thing at, uh, Fonduli yours and had a couple other little, little minor experiences of getting up on a stage. And, and, you know, I knew that I wanted to be on a stage and, uh, in Atlanta, I had some friends who had a band called freak the Jones and they had me open for them at, uh, good old days and little five points. And uh, long story short, uh, I didn't practice. I didn't take it seriously. I I didn't know what stage fright was because I'd never, 
I'd never experienced it. And there were about a hundred people there and uh, I got really bad anxiety and stage fright and uh, I bombed mm. horribly, embarrassed myself, probably embarrassed them, um, you know, embarrassed, uh, embarrassed the sport, so to speak, <laughs> you know, and uh, I was, I was crushed and I, I, I said, I'll never do that again. I'll never get on a stage again until I have something of value to offer. Mm. And so I set about actually sitting down and really getting real with it and saying, okay, you know, you can't just get up there and fake it. You, you, you got to know what you're doing because under pressure, you know, you're only as good as your worst practice. Um, and so time went by and I spent 25 years mm. uh, perfecting my style. And, you know, I wish I, I wish I had not spent that long um, because you can only learn so much in your bedroom. Um, you have to get up there and get back on the horse, so to speak, to, to progress. And so I've only been playing out now for about five years. Um, and I wish I'd started that process much, much sooner. But, uh, but when I did, when I did get back onto it, I, I was ready. Right on. I kind of, I look at it a, a bit in the same way. Um, you know, I, I was, in a band, I'm throwing up quotation marks right now with some guys I was in high school with and we played at like a couple parties and stuff, but never a proper gig. And then the, when I went off into college, that's when I was in a lot of bands. I was kind of a side man in quite a few bands and front man in a couple bands, but I always had people behind me. Yeah. And there is a vast difference to playing electric guitar in a loud club where people just want noise yeah. first, but you also have people behind you that if you break a string or sing out of tune or forget a part of the song, they're going to be filling all those holes. And then, you know, the first time I ever got up and really tried to play in front of people with an acoustic guitar where there's nothing to fall back on. Yeah. There's, it's a, tight, it's a tight rope. Yeah. It, without a safety net. Yeah. You're walking and, a tight rope. And that is a completely different thing. And that truly didn't happen until I was maybe, I want to say 25, 26, 27 in that range somewhere. And I, I did a little bit of, I actually, the first time I ever played my songs was at an open mic in Kentucky because I was there just wow. on vacation and I had a guitar and I saw a place had an open mic and I yeah. was like, okay, I'll go and play these songs I had just written. And it went well. I was like, okay, well, maybe I ought to try to do that. And then played a couple gigs and everything. And I, I, I gigged pretty decently before I moved here. Yeah. But there wasn't the opportunity that there is here. Yeah. So I think that I've played more in the last four years in Charleston than I played in the 35 years before I got here. And I thought that I had waited a long time. <laughs> and, and to hear like... Man, like you'd you'd waited and really worked on everything and now getting into gigs and and really waited before you started writing songs. Oh yeah. Yeah. And um, just just to be clear, just I'm now that I'm thinking about it, the, the twenty five years between bombing at good old days and playing in front of people again, I wasn't diligently see, diligently practicing the whole 25 years <laughs> because I would be amazing now if that was the case. <laughs> but there was a, a period of about two or three years where I sort of, you know, progressed three or four or five steps and then sort of stayed there and kept it up. But no, I, I you know, <laughs> I, I don't want people to think, wow, he, he practiced for 25 years. He should be he should be a lot better than that. But everybody's imagining a, a Rocky style training montage oh God, where no. by the end of it, you have a beard down to your knees and you're just shredding on the guitar neck. Yeah. Well, I, I did, <laughs> I did teach myself, a uh, uh, bastardized finger picking style. That's unique and it's all mine. Um, I pulled it out of thin air because my buddy who was a classical guitar player tried to get me to do all five fingers. And I used to watch him play Bach and, you know, all these beautiful pieces where he was using all five fingers and I just could never, I could never get that. I, it was too much. So I said, well, let me, let me just figure out what I can do. And so I developed my own finger picking style, which is a, a simplified style of Travis picking, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I've sort of crafted that and, and, you know, it, it's, it's definitely my sound. So I, I, I sort of, 
forced myself to learn that the hard way just hour after hour, just, just hammering it and, uh, wood shedding, they call it. Yeah. And, uh, so now, you know, uh, that comes natural, but it's, yeah, I don't think I could learn any other style of finger picking. I'm, I'm too, <laughs> I'm too locked into that. Yeah. I have a, I think I, I have a similar thing. I have my own way that my right hand does stuff and it's not, it's something that people I respect greatly in the way they can finger pick. They look at that and they go, well, I can't do that. And yeah. Like, well, I can't do anything else other than this. Right. But part of music is how open and vast it is. There, there's definitely room for virtuosos. Yeah. But then. <clears throat> Billy it, strings. Yeah. Right. And then it's, it's up to the individual to figure out how to turn their perceived shortcomings into their style. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. When you can actually take that and go, okay, this is what I got. Yeah. But I'm going to develop it. Right. And it's going to be the structure of what I do. You can take any old car and fix it up and paint it and polish it and it's going to look good. I yeah. mean, it's it's not going to be a Ferrari, but you know, it, you work with what you have and you try to make it as clean and as presentable as possible. And again, uh, I've always been a singer and, you know, I... I would love to be a great guitar player and I, I never will be. Um, but I keep working at it. I keep, I, I'm always conscious of trying to make that aspect better. And then the singing is what comes naturally and easy. Yeah. And so it's, it's, a you know, my brain is constantly battling between <laughs> listening to what I'm doing on the guitar and focusing on the lyrics and the, and the vocal, uh, nuances, but. And it's all a vehicle for the song. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could be the best guitar player in the world, and if it wasn't a good song, you're not going to cover that up. I or mean, if you're not a good singer, or if you yeah. or if you don't put your effort into singing it. I mean, there's some really good singers out there who sleepwalk through songs, and you just don't feel it. Um, yeah. That technically they're profound. Uh, they hit all the notes, and yeah. you know they breathe correctly and they project correctly. But you know, I, I. Uh, always wanted to be like uh you know the singer songwriters that i grew up listening to yeah who made you feel something like mm -hmm. jacks jackson brown and uh, jim croce and james taylor uh and none of those guys had amazing voices but they they could uh convey emotion and and they could make you they could they could bring you into the song and make you actually feel something and and that's to me, that's the ultimate goal um, for what I'm doing now is to try to walk in their footsteps. Yeah, I I think all my favorite songwriters, if, you know, I love Neil Young and Randy Newman, Tom Waits, oh, yeah. Bob Dylan. I mean, not a, not a great voice in that bunch, but a voice very befitting of what they do. Yeah. And, and as a vehicle for their songwriting, you couldn't ask for a more appropriate, you know, style. Yeah. Yeah, there's only one. There's only one uh, person I can think of whose songs are actually perhaps more enjoyable when they're sung by other people. That would be John Prine. Yeah. But, um, but even that, you know, even saying that, he, you know, if you heard his version first, you might you might like yeah. it better. But I I heard other people's versions yep. of his songs first, so I fell in love with those. And then when I heard his, I said, oh well, okay, he's not not as <laughs> Not as dynamic a singer as some of those other people, but you know, I've always thought that about songwriter. my my favorite songwriter is Tom Waits. Yeah, and I enjoy when other people do Tom Waits songs as long as they don't try to sound like them. Right, right. as long as they do their own thing with it. Yeah, because you got to gargle uh, <laughs> gravel and razor blades yeah. and wash it down with hundred and hundred proof uh, whiskey to get that voice. It's a process, and you don't come back from it. No. So, how did we get from Playing Jim Croce songs from playing songs you liked uh, from to writing your own songs. Um, I was playing open mics. I I uh, after twenty five years of hiding uh, because of insecurity and anxiety and not wanting to bomb again and not wanting to embarrass myself. I finally got the guts to play an open mic and I felt like okay, I'm back. I'm still nervous. I'm still you know, still got stage fright, but I'm going to work through it. So I just poured myself into open mics. I went to all the open mics I could playing covers and, uh, really enjoying it. And I, I was 
getting better at playing covers and getting better at not being as nervous and um things were going great and i was playing the ice house open mic that uh butch uh ran on sunday night starting at 10 o'clock martin butcher yeah yep. yeah and uh butch is a amazing guy great guy made everyone feel welcome made everyone feel confident um always had nice things to say about your performance um i can't say enough good about butch he's a, he's a hell of a human being but i loved playing that open mic and uh there was another music buddy there um, who asked me one night, he said, hey, how come you never do any originals? And I said, well, I don't have any. And he laughed and said, oh, man, that's pretty funny. You, you, know, you had me going. And he said, no, really, why don't you do your originals? And I said, I, I really don't have any. And uh, long story short, he kind of read me the riot act and said, well, you know, that's messed up, man. You know, that, that's really selfish of you to, uh, to not write, you know. Um, you've got experiences, you've, you've told me stories about your life and man, you've got a, a well to go to and you're not even, you're not even trying. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's, you know, shame on you. And, uh, I was really shocked by somebody, you know, raking me over the coals for not writing original music. I, yeah. I spent the next three days saying, man, forget him. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm happy doing covers. I don't need to write. But then, everything he said started creeping in my head and, and, you know, I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe he's got a point and, uh, what's the worst that could happen? You know, I write a song that I don't like and I don't play it for anybody. So I set about writing an original and I had one original that I had written many, many, many years ago, but it, you know, it was not even worth mentioning. It wasn't something I was gonna even admit to. Yeah. So I wrote a song and played it at an open mic, and uh, I asked a friend, I said, what'd you think? And he said, oh, it's okay. And that was high praise, like, <laughs> okay. He said it was okay, so yeah. I, you know, I guess I should try write another one. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Ed Sheeran uh, has a video where he talks about uh, you have to start writing uh, and keep writing, and it's like turning on an old spigot. The water runs rusty and dirty and terrible in the beginning but eventually it runs clear he said you have to write all your bad songs to get to the good ones and uh i feel like now i'm really starting to get to that clear water i'm getting getting to what i consider to be some good ones and i'm i'm hoping they stay good you definitely seem to be flowing i remember um the the two uh things i mentioned earlier brian's podcast and then the mufic uh Brian's podcast, you had like a six song is, would we call it an EP or would we call it a uh, seven, seven song? Seven song. Technically, yeah. technically it was an album. I think it made the, made the definition of album by 30 seconds in, <laughs> in length. Um, I think it has to be 30 minutes or more okay. to be an album. Um, and it has to be more than two tracks. It's such a sliding scale on things, yeah. you know, it was a glorified, it was a big EP or, a, or a short album. Yeah. But the first record was seven songs. The second record was seven songs. And this record is seven songs. Yeah. I, I think people just don't have the patience for a 12, 14, 15 song album. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I kind of, I kind of don't want to put everything on one record and then have to start all over. So I, yeah. so I sort of pick the best seven at the time that go together and go with that. Now, when you, are you an album listener? Are you a singles guy? How do you listen to music? Oh, albums all the way. Yeah. Um, I, I rarely will listen to a single song unless I'm just, you know, want to hear that one song and I'm, you know, in the middle of doing something else. But yeah, when I listen to artists, I, I try to listen to the album because most of the stuff that I like um, was recorded um, in an album format meant to be listened to yeah as a complete unit so yeah i when i listen to your music i listen to most of my music on apple i'm an apple guy yeah i, I drank the i drank the kool-aid on apple so your first album isn't on apple it's just on spotify yeah so i listened to that that one a lot and then i went into spotify and i tried to listen to your first one and it kept shuffling things and it kept not letting me listen to it in the order that you put it out in. And I got so mad at Spotify Yeah, because I'm like, when people make records, 
that's not an accident. Right. The, song, the order they put the songs in, the, the way they do it, it's not an accident. Oh yeah, it, you, you 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 labor over that decision. Like what what's going to be the first song? You know, what, out of the gate. Yeah. You, you know, you you got to pick something good, but you don't want to put your best. Right. Because then you don't want to let them down the rest of the record. Right. So. Or and if you have, sometimes you have something where you're like, oh, that's the last song. That's what this ends with. And yeah. And, but I I ended up having to like go into YouTube and make a playlist because oh, wow. I could see the track listing. But I just, maybe I don't know Spotify good enough. But yeah, that's me getting annoyed at Spotify. Let me just say thank you so <laughs> so much for caring enough to do that, man. I, I, I think you're one of like three people on the planet who have actually listened to that record in its entirety with, you know, intending to anyway. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I know a lot of friends and associates, music people uh, did listen to it when it first came out, but I don't think it's had many spins since then. So thank you. When I listen to music, I like to, I listen to it in sort of different ways. Um, I like to listen to something very deliberately and kind of sit through and catch the nuances. And then I sort of like to listen to it passively for a while. Yeah. And then, because what that does is it kind of puts it in your brain. Um, and then you go back and listen deliberately again and you're finding like stuff that you were experiencing for the first time. Now it's in there. Now you know it. Yeah. So yeah, I've I've spun those records. Uh, your second one I listened to the most because it was on Apple Music and it was easy for me. And there's there's a lot more to the like on the second because it's got so many other instruments and and better production value. The the first one was just uh, me and the guitar, um, and uh, really honestly that was uh, not even meant to be an album. In, yeah. in the beginning, it was basically me putting down songs capturing songs um cleanly and professionally uh, and then i said well you know the what's the difference between a demo and, a, and an album i guess it's the the artwork and the production and what you call it so i said well let's call it an album but i, I didn't want to give it a name because i think that would have been misleading so that's why i called it in the live room i did, did didn't want to hype it it was just sure it's just me in the live room and that's all it is you know well Talk a little bit about the impetus that actually made this whole thing take place because at the time you just wanted to go hang out at Allendahl Green and see what that was all about. What happened? Um, well, I was uh, hearing about Allendahl Green. I'm, I'm actually playing there uh, tomorrow night uh, for the fourth time. Um, but I'd been hearing about Allendahl Green for a couple of years and uh, – I always wanted to go out there and I thought Allendahl was two and a half hours away. I thought Allendahl was somewhere <laughs> in the upstate and it just sounded like somewhere yeah. far away. Right. And I said, you know, that's, that's a hell of a long way to go for, you know, one night of music on a Wednesday. And then, you know, I found out, well, it's, it's not in the upstate. It's, you know, it's right here. Yeah. And, uh, so I kept telling myself, I got to get out there. I got to get out there. I, it's a it's a potential place that I might want to play or might be able to play. And not, you know, not to mention it's probably pretty cool. I mean, everyone says it's great. So one night, uh, it was in uh, January. It was the night we had the super blue moon. Uh, the last time we had a super moon that was also a blue moon. Um, so I'm thinking 2017, and uh, it was like. 27 degrees at 5 p.m. <laughs> and I, this little voice in, in my head said, tonight's the night, you're going tonight. Yeah. And my rational side said, no, not that's, that's ridiculous. It's going to be freezing cold out there. No one's going to be there. It's going to be, they might not even, might not even have it. It's going to be so cold. Oh, that's not going to stop it. <laughs> and uh, so, but the, the gut, the voice in my gut said, tonight is the night. And so I, I said, all right, well, you know, you don't, you don't go against that voice. And so I, I went out there, met some cool people, met Eddie White, uh, got his business card. He said, yeah, email me, you know? Um, but, um, the funny part of the story is I, I met some people there and talked to them about maybe 20 minutes and they said, yeah, we come here all the time. We've been coming here for years and years. We love this place. And they, they couldn't get over the fact it was my first time there. They were like, this is your first time, man. That's amazing. And I, I said, yeah, you know, I, maybe someday I would like to play here. And they said, oh, you play music? I said, yeah, I'm a singer-songwriter, you know. And we chatted a little bit about that. 
maybe five minutes. And then uh, this couple, they said, oh, there's Eddie right there. And let's go meet him. And I, I was kind of nervous, like, wow, you know, yeah. the, the big dog, you know, right off the bat, first time there, I'm going to talk to the man. And so we walk up and I thought they were just going to introduce me and that would be it. And they're talking to Eddie and then the guy turns, points at me and he goes, hey, Eddie, this this is our good friend, Ron. <laughs> and I'm I'm feeling completely awkward now because I'm like, wow, good friend. I, that's, that's a big stretch because we just met, you know, so, but I'm going to, you know, it's cool. I'm not going to not going to deny him. I'm just going to go with it. He goes, he's an amazing singer songwriter. <laughs> he is incredible and you need to book him. Now I'm feeling yeah. like I'm part of a con that I didn't want to be in on. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, this is all lies. You don't know me. You don't know if I even play. You met me 20 minutes ago. Now I'm your good friend and I'm an amazing singer songwriter. <laughs> and you're telling him he needs to book me. They're writing a check. You got a cash. <laughs> yeah. And so Eddie looks, looks at me. What, and it felt like he looked at me for 10 minutes. Yeah. He looked me up and down and I could just feel the tension in the air. You know, I was like, I, I don't know what to do other than just go with it. And he goes, okay, all right, well, here's my card, you know, email me. And I walked away like, oh, phew, man, that could have gone so bad, you know? <laughs> so I waited two weeks to email him because I felt guilty. I was like, man, that's, you know, I, I feel like I perpetrated this fraud. Um, well, but, you never want to come off as opportunistic and yeah. like, oh, I just came because I wanted and yeah, it. I yeah. just really wanted to check the place out and, For sure. and maybe, maybe meet the guy who runs it just <laughs> casually, you know, yeah. so I could recognize him the next three or four times I show up. Right. So he, he booked me for June 13th, which thank God was five months away. So I had time to really get a set together and, and, you know, keep in mind, okay, I'm going to be on this big stage because you know i'd only played open mics and coffee houses and so i said man you know I, I gotta i gotta really prepare and in that time i got a new guitar um i wrote more songs and you know and uh it was a singer in the round the three of us on stage we each got to do two songs and took turns and it went really well it went it went great and uh it was the biggest day of my life because i was actually playing my own stuff well to the largest crowd I'd ever been in front of um, since I bombed in front of a hundred people <laughs> at good old days. So yeah. it, it was a, it was like a, a big relief. Like, okay, I, I can do this, you know? Well, for folks that live in the Charleston area and happen to be listening to this and have not gone to Allwendahl Green, consider this my glowing endorsement of Eddie White Allendahl Green and all the folks that work out there. Every Wednesday out in Allendahl, which is just about 20 minutes past Mount Pleasant, um, they put on this thing called the Allendahl Green Barn Jam. And it's local bands, it's local singer-songwriters, but it's also touring bands that are coming through the region. And I think it's like $5 to get in. It was $5 for the longest time. It's been $10 ahead for the last, I guess, year, but well, it, it's worth it's $10. well worth it. It's well worth it. You get four plus hours of music. It's an amazing. It it's a unique place, and it's an amazing place. It's the best kept musical secret in the Low Country by far. I I can't believe it took me so long to get out there. Um, there are people who have been going for years and years, and will continue to go. Um, I you know it's an important venue because it. I was thinking about this on the on the ride over, hoping we'd talk about this. Everyone in the Low Country understands uh, about wetlands and estuaries. Um, you know, the coastline has all this land where you know all these uh, sea creatures have their young, and you know when the young are grown up enough and developed, they go into the ocean. And Onda Green is like a musical estuary. It's, yeah. it's where young new talent can sort of spread their wings for the first time and get that opportunity that they wouldn't get anywhere else. No, no one's going to book you as a headliner when you're in that fledgling, fledgling stage. But Eddie gives people chances like me. Um, and tomorrow's my fourth time out there. And, you know, I've developed so much with the confidence I've gained partly from playing there. So, yeah, if you can imagine just, People once a week getting together. If it's cold, they'll have little fires that they'll sit around. 
there's a lot of the time there's brick oven pizza. It's BYOB. Uh, sometimes there's food and craft vendors that are there. Kid friendly, dog it, friendly. Yeah. And it, it's always such a great hangout. And from a musician's perspective, they have a crew. Yeah. They have a man running sound fantastically, like really putting the care into making sure that you sound great. They have a stage manager. They have a fella who will sit there and make sure you have everything that you need and it's so cool. There's like a little barn that you sit in and they roll up a door. It's like garage door. Yeah. 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 So many, so many gigs that you play, you got to go in and set up your own sound and you know, but when you think about when you go see a live band, like all of a sudden the lights go on and the band comes out and it's a, it's such like a, the show is beginning Yeah, and all in dog green, Eddie will come up and introduce you and, and if Eddie has ever had a bad word to say about anybody, I've never heard it. No. Eddie is one of the coolest guys you're going to meet. Um, day before or day of, he always puts a video up on Facebook. I think he's riding his bike around yeah. his neighborhood. It makes talking me dizzy about, watching yeah. that video. <laughs> but as a performer, it is such a great experience to walk into an event that it's just... They're, they are straight up professional um uh, preston and alejandro do sound out there and they do an amazing job um they have lights they have equipment um they troubleshoot on the fly um they they do it just like you would see in a big club but it's a down home it's kind of a cross between a camp out and a mini music festival yeah um, but it definitely got that down home backyard feel but it's it's uh, it's definitely professional as far as the music and the lights and the sound and the equipment they have. I mean, they, they're doing it right. They're just doing it right. So in the lead up to your first time playing All in Dog Green, you thought to yourself, "Man, I have nothing recorded. I got nothing to show. I I gotta. If Eddie wants to hear something, I have nothing to send him." Yeah. Well, I, got, I was in the process. I I was I went into the studio in uh, I think it was March. Mm -hmm. before the june gig so i had the tracks um they were being mastered and uh, i had rough mixes um and uh so the 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 first cd came out uh i think right around the time of that gig i i didn't have the cds in hand that night but the cd came out shortly after playing there and i was i was off and running i mean making records even as simple and low budget and low key as that was. And, and I, I got to say that first record was done at hybrid audio solutions. And, uh, that is an amazing studio. If you're looking for a great studio with a, a very homey boutique feel, uh, hybrid audio solutions is an amazing place. And I want to record there again, but I've also wanted variety and, and other, you know, to try other studios, sure. but they did it a lot to make that record sound great. Now my playing is not stellar. Uh, and so you can hear all my, you know, little mistakes and whatnot, but they captured the sound of that guitar in a, in a, in a way that I haven't heard since actually. Well, that record in the live room, um, you actually pressed it in a limited release, yeah, but it is available on YouTube and Spotify and not Apple music. But, um, you can go on YouTube and make a playlist so it plays in the correct order. <laughs> um, but one thing I, I really enjoyed about that record is it's called In the Live Room. It's literally you sitting there playing the songs, no overdubs, no... It, it's, They're all live, yeah. Yeah, no, no frills. It's the song and... That's it. You. Yeah, it, I did three takes of most of the songs and I did four takes of a couple... I went back a week later and sat down and listened to each take and made a decision. Yeah. I said, okay, for this song, I want take two. For this song, I want take four. For mm -hmm. this song, I want take one. There was no, uh, you know, it was a full take from beginning to end. Nothing was plugged in. There was, there was, uh, yeah, there was no, no pro tools at, at play. It was literally a live recording. And, you know, considering that, 
I think all the takes are are pretty darn good. They're 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 pretty good for a one off live recording. Um, but then Cottonwood was the next record, and I said, well, you know, I I I want to use a little bit of that Pro Tools magic. Yeah. I want to I want to you know I want to take advantage of what's out there. I'm I'm not good enough to do the Dylan thing and go in and do three takes and one of <laughs> one of them is incredible. Um, so kind of had a foot in both camps for the second record. Um, and then for this record, I made, uh, you know, full use of, uh, uh, the producer and his abilities, um, as engineer and producer. And, uh, we made sure we didn't overproduce it, but we took advantage of, Hey, this little part here is kind of weak. Let's find another track, another uh, take where that part's strong uh-huh. and, and plug it in. So, you know, there, there's a lot of cutting and pasting on the new record, but for the good of the record, it's, yeah. it, it's, it, it makes it better. I mean, a lot of people are ready to step up and really be purists about things, but man, cutting and pasting happened on tape. Yeah. Like splices happened. Oh, the Beatles uh, did it. So. The Beatles, if the Beatles did it, it must be right. Yeah. The second record, Cottonwood Sessions. Few more things going on in the instrumentation. C- pedal steel here and there. Yeah. Some drums here and there. Um, fiddle. Yeah, fiddle. Is that Bobby Napier playing? Fiddle? Bobby Napier and Lisa Deacons. Okay. Uh, it was supposed to be uh, Karen Egan and Marcy Shore uh-huh. originally, uh, and Karen did come out for the first day of recording. Um, but we spent a 10 hour day and ended up with nothing of value after 10 hours. And I was really defeated and, <laughs> and, and broke. I was like, man, I just, I just blew, you know, uh, a lot of money paying all these musicians and paying for 10 hours of studio time. And we got nothing out of it. Um, so Karen didn't, didn't come back. Um, uh, Bobby Napier stepped in, uh, he and I were playing together at that time and he stepped in for the rest of the recording and, uh, Marcy Shore moved to North Carolina. So Mm -hmm. she was unavailable. So she recommended Lisa Deacons and Lisa came out and I think she played on two songs and she was done in 20 minutes (laughs) and she couldn't believe how fast she, you know, made a hundred bucks. She was like, is that it? You, you're done. You, I can go. And we're like, yeah, you did it. That's awesome. You know, I, paid her in cash and she got back in her car and she was back on the road in 25 minutes because we already had all the levels set and we already had the mic set so she she literally put the headphones on and rocked it out but um i called that record the cottonwood sessions Uh uh-huh kind of along the lines of the basement tapes Mm -hmm. or any other record that has sessions in it uh because again i didn't feel it was really good enough to deserve a title (laughs) I said, you know, th- th- this is a little rough around the edges. L- let's just call it the sessions. Okay. And it's sort of like a documentary. Sure. Um, th- these are the tracks that weren't good enough to be put out, uh, you know, as an album. So let's call it the Cottonwood Sessions. And I felt like that was that was correct. So you know, I didn't. I I, I never want to overpromise. I never want someone to listen to to look at my record and expect more than I can give them. So if you look at a record and it says the something something sessions, you're al- already thinking, well, you know, this is not ready for prime time. This Either there's something live going on, or it was a documentary of a of yeah, a situation. It yep. was, you know, this, and so I feel like that was fair. You know, the Cottonwood sessions is just that. It's it's recordings of some sessions, uh, but this record, like I said, I have a amazing producer, uh, Doug Williams. Um, he produced the Avet Brothers' first two albums and hundreds of more records since then. Um, and once I've stepped up to actually working with a producer, um, it took it to a level where I said, okay, this record deserves a title. This, this is a real album that yeah. can, that can stand up to, you know, more or less any album as far as being legit. It's, it's not, it's not, you know, a side project or a B side or, outtakes this this you don't is a need real to qualify record. it it's a right. record this yeah. is a real record and what's the title of this record country made for kings country made for kings all right before we dive into the record uh do you got a song you'd like to play for us yeah yeah i brought a couple today yeah what do you got uh, i think i want to start off with um two weeks in tennessee all right let's hear it Two 
weeks gone since I left the home fires burning, chasing highways, chasing stars, but I found smoky back rooms, day old coffee, beat up couches, run down bars. You've always told me that I had to go my own way I always knew that I had to go Now it's too late to call I don't want to wake you It's too late to call But I want you to know I've been talking to the angel on my shoulder I've been struggling to hear my song Two weeks in Tennessee God knows I miss you but Two weeks anywhere is two weeks too long Two weeks anywhere is two weeks too long I'm not ashamed to say I'm wrapped around your finger Twisted up like Honeysuckle vine Two weeks in Tennessee God knows I miss you Two weeks in Tennessee Now the sun don't shine Two weeks gone since I left the home fires burning Chasing highways, chasing stars But I found smoky back rooms Day old coffee Beat up couches and run down bars Smoky back rooms, day old coffee, beat up couches, and run down bars. I've been talking to the angel on my shoulder, I've been struggling to hear my song. Two weeks in Tennessee, God knows I miss you. But two weeks anywhere is two weeks too long. Two weeks anywhere is two weeks too long. Two weeks anywhere is two weeks too long. That's awesome, man. Tell me about that one. Um, well, that one is a prime example of how I've been writing. Um, I'll come across what I call a nugget. Um, it, it's a phrase or an idea or just a line. Um, and uh, I'll start to search for a melody and sort of sing it to myself. Uh, and that was one of those songs that was one line. Um, I liked the alliteration of Two Weeks in Tennessee because it's got a lot of T's and a lot of S's and it it's just sounded catchy and it just rolled off the tongue. And I started searching for a melody for it. And for about a week, I just walked around humming and singing that one line, Two Weeks in Tennessee. Um, 
And uh, then I started thinking about, you know, okay, well, you know, where does this line go? What what kind of song does it go in? And uh, it's like putting a puzzle together. Um, you just start with a few pieces that fit, and then you just find other pieces that fit. And uh, as it takes shape, it takes shape. And I, I had no idea where that song was going, what it was going to be about. Um, no clue until it was more or less mostly done. Um, and... Um, I think some of the best stuff for me comes together that way. Um, I, I hear a line or I, I think of a verse and uh, I just, I, I start to go into a space where I'm imagining the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. It's like a clue. It's like uh, in the detective shows where the guy walks in and looks at the crime scene and, you know, he says, oh, they must have known the killer. You yeah. Know? This is personal, you know. I know there's something here. There's something here, you yeah. know. That that vase is broken in an odd way, and, you know, why are there shoe prints on the <laughs> ceiling, you know? And they start to imagine what took place in that room, and I do that less dramatically with a, with a verse or a line, and I, I start imagining, you know, well, what, what, what kind of song would this be, or where would this line fit? And I start adding lines until I get to a point where it doesn't make sense, or I don't like it, and then I back up, yeah, and then let it let it settle for a while, and and go back at it. And a lot of times, it never works out. A lot of times, I've got a lot of songs that are half written, and I've got little nuggets, little ideas floating around that someday maybe they'll join together. And the cases are unsolved. Maybe those maybe <laughs> those uh, little little pieces will join together, and two what was two songs will come together and be one song someday. But, um, do you ever find yourself, do you ever overwrite and then edit? Like you actually come through and you have an extra verse and you say, nah, that's the verse that goes or no, I'm, I'm always, um, I'm always struggling to, you know, to, to come up with enough. Um, yeah. but everything I do lately anyway, I think leaves plenty to the imagination. It, it doesn't overtell the story. Um, it, and, and that's just a, just dumb luck on my part as a writer. I, I have the ability to put together a framework of a, of a story that makes sense. That's about something, but it's got enough, uh, enough, uh, vagueness in it that you can actually, and those are the songs I always loved. Um, yeah. songs that I could imagine my own story to it. Um, yeah, I know it's about a girl, uh, but you know, it could be any girl. I, it could be the girl I know, you know, and it's not over detailed to where it shuts anyone out. So I always wondered how Bob Dylan could throw out those songs that have eight, nine, 10 verses. Oh yeah. But I think in what you said, I think it is because they're so vague. Um, I think that if he was more specific, it would be too much, but some of those songs with all those verses, man, I'm not going to cut any of those out. Dylan's like <laughs> Dylan's like painting a masterpiece and then painting over half of it with a different yeah. painting and then putting some collage on it and then painting it again and it's so intricate and so there's so many things and at the end it gives you a it does give you a painting it gives you an impression but it's it's so deep yeah. and and I'm you know I've I'm not uh one who would pretend to uh, ever have that kind of ability uh, if I paint something good the first time, that's it. I'm I'm signing it and calling it a song. I'm well, not... he'll go he'll go through and change things up. Like yeah. he'll change verses around even later, and then he'll do versions that are different. Yeah. And like he'll he'll take a picture of the painting, and then he'll make a photocopy of that picture, and it just it all works. And I don't know how he does it. Yeah, he's a he's a genius, and uh, I I think that uh, I have. I won't even say have, but I am uh, privileged to be at times in the presence of the muse. Um, and when I'm there, I know I'm there yeah. and I'm grateful and I try to get as much done in that. And there've been times when I've gotten up in the morning and sat down with a guitar and uh, I won't move for five, six, seven hours and, until the song is done. Um, and then I'm just exhausted and then I'll go back a few days later and maybe tidy up or maybe look at it a little more critically and say, okay, well, you know, to, to someone who 
has never heard this before. Does all this make sense? Is the verb tense correct? Mm-hmm. Is it, did I switch, you know, between, uh, you know, me and him, you know, I, I just try to clean it up because one thing I found is that, uh, a lot of songs with great music and great grooves and great solos and great drums and great vocals, they don't last because they overlook those details. Yeah. And when you listen to a song 50 times, those things start to bother you. Mm. Like when you, when, for me anyway, when I listen to a song many, many times, it has to be more or less lyrically tight. It, you know, I, I think a lot of people overlook the value of the verses. Yeah. They think, well, you know, this verse can be sort of a throwaway verse. It's just going to get us back to that cool chorus. And that works in the short term because yeah. people, they like the chorus, they like the groove, they like yeah. the solo. But to, to have a song that you'll listen to 10, 15, 20 years from now, it's got to be lyrically very, very good and, and solid. Like, you know, sitting on the dock of a bay, uh, you know, Otis Redding, there's not one word you could change in that. Right. Um, and this may be a hot take, but if you put it up to that sort of scrutiny, Led Zeppelin sometimes falls apart. <laughs> uh. If you can understand the verses. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. That with rock and roll, so you can hide behind, <laughs> well, what did he say there? I, yeah. I, I'm not sure. I, you know, I caught 70% of the words, but uh, there was so much noise and it was, I, I don't know, he was screaming and, but with acoustic singer songwriter stuff, yeah. your your words are standing there naked in front of the world, yeah. and that that's what you hang your hat on is your words. Uh, nobody ever said, um, you know, I love, uh, you know, Jim Croce's songs because of his choice of chord progression, or right. or I love Bob Dylan's uh, finger picking on the acoustic guitar. It it is about the words. Yeah. Um, now James Taylor is an amazing guitar player, and yeah. I, you know he he kind of has best of both worlds, but when push comes to shove, people would take Taylor's lyrics over his tasty guitar. Sure. So when it comes to this record, how has your recording process been different? What's been, what, what has changed? Oh man. Cottonwood sessions was trial by fire. It was paying a lot of money to learn a lot of good, valuable lessons. Um, I had more money and, inspiration and enthusiasm than I had uh, insight and knowledge, but I walked out of it with a lot of insight and knowledge. Um, I learned so many things. One thing I learned is you can't rush the process. Um, If you do, it shows. Yeah. There's no getting around it. Um, Also, when you have no producer, or I should say no, because Josh Jarman and I co-produced that record, mm-hmm. but neither one of us are quote unquote producers, um, uh, except maybe in the sense of being amateur producers. But if you don't have a producer, it's like shooting a movie with no director. Um, you might have the best actors in the world, but if there's no director, it, it's not going to be a great film. Um, so I learned that I need an expert. I need a professional to guide me and help me in the process because it's not, it's not my world. Uh, you know, I, I, it's too much to know. Recording is a completely different muscle from live performance. Um, although you don't have very many people who are good at recording that aren't also experienced in live performance. However, just because you can get through a song live in front of people and when the, you know, everything's loud doesn't mean that you can capture those nuances in in a recording. And I left a lot on the table with Cottonwood sessions there, you know, going back and listening to it over the years, I realized had I taken a little more time, it could have been so much better on my part. And then on the, on the instruments that were, you know, accompanying me, I didn't give them the chance to do their best work. Mm -hmm. Um, It was a rush job from start to finish. And we did a hell of a job putting together, you know, a record I'm super proud of. uh, But uh, it just, we just didn't give ourselves enough time. And, and also having a producer, you have 
a partner in crime because it's not just your album. It's, right. it's their album. They're putting their name on it. Right. And this producer I'm working with, uh, Doug Williams, like I said, he uh, produced the first two Avet Brothers records. And those two records launched those guys which, into what became, you know, uh, world tours, um, put them on the map. Not, I'm not saying he put them on the map, but, you know, he was there putting was their- part of it, yeah. He was part of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he was helping them, guiding them, recording them, producing them, and uh, letting their talent show and, and bringing out the best in them. And, you know, they've, you know, gone big time. And uh, that's one reason I reached out to him because I said, you know, these these guys- you know, we're from North Carolina and they found a little studio and uh, they worked with this guy and yeah, I want to be like them. You know, I that's that's the ultimate dream is to, you know, come from nowhere and go somewhere. And yeah. so I reached out to him and said, hey, you know, I, I if you would have me, I'd like to work with you. And when I went up to meet him, uh, I knew he was the guy. Yeah. Um, I knew he was somebody who would tolerate all my eccentricities <laughs> and anxieties and, you know, cause I'm, I'm not good in the studio. I, I'm, I'm a bundle of nerves. Yeah. When that red light goes on. Oh, that's tough. I get, I get, you know, I get, uh, like in, in medicine, they call it white coat fever. When, mm. when the doctor walks in the room, your blood pressure shoots up. Yeah. I get that in the studio. I, I'm not comfortable in a studio. I know I have to be there, but I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. I actually, I do all my own recording because I don't like anybody else being there. Yeah. Um, I've had experiences in studios before and every second has a dollar amount attached to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when the record button is hit, when it is hit, you got to deliver. And, and, and regardless of whether you deliver or not, when the tape is stopped or the, you know, pro tools is stopped, either you got to live with what you have or pay for more time. Yeah. And, you know, the funny thing is uh, I went up to Winston-Salem, North Carolina to uh, EMR Recorders, which is uh, where uh, the studio, that's the name of the studio. And uh, it took me probably three, four hours the first day just to get over the, the jitters. <laughs> and, yeah. um, you know, Doug was so patient and basically he let me wear myself out mm. to where I didn't, I just didn't care as much. Yeah. And then I was able to do good stuff. Cause, sure. Because I was like, okay, this is the 16th time I've played this GD chord progression. Yeah. Let's just get this down. Let's do this. And, you know, I wasn't so worried about, oh, this has to be the one. This has to be perfect. I said, you know what? I just need to get, you know, a 92 out of 100 and, yeah. I'm, and we'll move on. And once I hit that point of kind of being sick of, yeah. of working on that song, I said, you know, I'm just going to do this well and not worry about perfect because we're never going to get perfect. Well, part of a producer's job is to figure out the individual and how to get the best out of that individual. Yeah. And it sounds like, uh, you're getting in your own way. Oh, big time. And, and it's his job to figure out, okay, I'm just going to let him run around in circles until he's had enough. And then he'll, we're going to squeeze a couple good takes out of him. He'll calm down. Yeah. 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 And, and, and it, it did, it, it knocked it, you know, the anxiety just got tired. The anxiety got yeah. exhausted and said, you know, okay, you've only got a day and a half left. Let's, let's just do this. Yeah. It's and time to, let, let's call, you know, let's just, you know, call it what it is. You're not a professional. You're, you're not a professional musician. You don't have three months here to do this record. Right. Right. You, you have two days. Yeah. I had two days, Wednesday and Thursday <laughs> for seven tracks. And most people would say, well, that's plenty of time. Nope. Know? But, you know, I I don't play five hours a day every day. Right. Because I, I do have a day job. And uh, so I obviously practiced a lot before I went up there. But um, like I said, when the headphones go on and, the, and, you know, you hear through the headphones, okay, ready when you are. We're rolling. Take one. It's like. <sighs> yeah. And, oh, you yeah. know, I can't tell you how many times the first note or the first chord was bad and, yeah. I, and I was like up oh, screwed it up let's start again okay take two you know and <laughs> okay take five 
all right, just 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 play. You know, just yeah. I'll just capture everything. You we'll, stop wanting to hear what the take number is. We'll just we'll sort through it later. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, but uh, we worked from eight thirty a.m. till ten p.m. on Wednesday. We wow. never we never left the studio. We he never broke for lunch. Wow. He was at the at the board the whole time. He heated up some food in the microwave and ate at the board. <laughs> I was so exhausted when I went back to the hotel, I literally ate some food and sat down on the couch and woke up on the couch. <laughs> I was so exhausted. And the next day we got together at 8 a.m. and finished around 10 p.m. Wow. So it was two marathon days. And we were working with a drummer, which I'd never worked with before. Mm -hmm. And working with the drummer, uh, let me just go ahead and mention his name. Yeah. Chazare Schenk. And, uh, he was an amazing guy, very cool, very laid back. He knew that he was working with a rookie, and uh, he really helped calm me down quite a bit. And he actually tricked me uh, <laughs> for, the, for the good. He said, well, why don't you just do a practice take, man, and let me drum along to kind of learn. Oh, yeah. And I said, oh, practice take. Okay, yeah, yep. let's, let's just do a... Dr and I didn't even know it was being recorded. That's Studio Mind Games 101, And man. so we did, we did a practice <laughs> take, and it was awesome. And then at the end, he was like, gotcha got the take that was he goes that was the best one you've done yeah. and i said what do you mean he's like no that's the one man we we just captured it you know um so he helped a lot uh the other musicians um uh marcy shore yeah who, who was going to be on cottonwood uh -huh. she had to move back to north carolina to help her mom and when i found out i was going to be recording in north carolina i said let me let me contact her maybe she can you know maybe she can make the drive Turns out she lives in Winston Salem. Um, she lives like two miles from the studio. Uh huh. As a matter of fact, she had her first fiddle lesson just around the corner from the studio. So she said, "Yeah, that's super convenient. I'd love to help you out." So Marcy Shore played fiddle. Um, Patrick Lawrence played upright bass, and uh, Deshaun Hickman played pedal steel. So we had one fiddle player pedal steel, uh, upright bass, and drums. Um, and the other players came in after those two days. Um, so were those guys all playing along with you live then? Uh, no, uh, we recorded uh, my guitar and vocals. Uh -huh. And the songs that have drums, um, the drums are recorded. Uh, with the guitar and the With the guitar yeah. and vocals. It's incredibly hard to go back and do drums later. Yeah, well... We um we did we did some interesting thing. We did it every way you could do it. Uh -huh. Um, one way was, um, and this was pretty sneaky. Um, I was playing guitar, mm -hmm. but it was running to an amp in another room. Okay, and it had a mic on that amp in a in a separate room that was soundproof. Yeah, he was playing drums along with me. Mm -hmm. To keep me, help keep me in time. Yeah. And then we took the guitar track and he went back in by himself and listened to the guitar track and played the real version of his drums. And then you went back and redid your stuff to the drums or no, that? No, no. Uh, we, we captured the guitar track. Yeah. While the drums were playing. Yeah. But you couldn't hear the drums in couldn't the Couldn't hear the drums. Because yeah. the, the amp was in a different room. Okay. Yeah. So we, we, we got, oh, yeah. Doug was, was pretty crafty about overcoming my limitations and, uh, we, we, the, but the working with the drummer was painful for me. It was so, <laughs> and I felt bad for him because I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't play with the drums because, you know, playing the same version, exactly the same yeah. over and over. I just, you know, I feel it a little different this time. Did you it, try click tracks at all? Yeah, and uh, that drove me insane. I said, yeah. I said, get this click out of my head. I yeah, can't, the first time, I can't take it. The first time people play in a studio, they try to get you to play to a click first. People try the click right off the it's bat. Awful. Uh, I have times where I record all my own stuff and I do all the instruments on it too, so I have to go do the drums later and everything. So I'm about a 50-50 split, whether it's a song that can do a click, because a click, it tightens it up to the point where it starts to not feel organic anymore, starts to get robotic. 
sometimes that click is every all that's holding the things together. <laughs> and it's it is so hard to start playing a song and have it be the same tempo, have it be the same you're the same distance away from the microphone because you know, in an ideal situation, a producer can go through and take a little part of this take and a little part of this take and comp together just like the perfect take. And and for that to happen, you have to be able to have it editable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I learned a lot about Pro Tools and I learned a lot about how hard it is to get everybody on the same timeline. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the drummer was fantastic because he, he played a, you know, a very relaxed style that, yeah. that had a little bit of wiggle room. Um, you know, it's, we're not doing dance music, so it's, yeah. it's not to the microsecond, but I, I really like the outcome because these songs still sound live because I was playing them just yeah. like I did in the live room, but I was, we were taking different parts and putting them where they needed to be. So every song has got a little bit of two or three other takes in it at some point, but, sure. but the majority of it is still one take. So it still feels like a live record in a way, but it's much, much tighter and smoother than Cottonwood Sessions. Cottonwood Sessions, you you can really, you can really tell it's a cut and paste you know, kind of thing. There's a lot of hard fade outs yeah, on yep. parts where the, where the fiddle just falls off a cliff and you're like, yeah, sure. no fiddle ever did that, you know? Yeah, like, uh, yeah. But this one, we, we made sure that everything sounded correct and sounded right. Um, well, this is all just part of your evolution. Oh yeah. I'm in, learning. Yeah. As a, as a songwriter, as a recording artist, as a musician, and the, the few cuts that you've said to me that I've heard off of this record, it sounds fantastic. Thank you. And and one thing that, you know, by being the guy that does all of his own stuff, I'm jealous that you're finding these musicians that are so, uh, so into serving the song in an unselfish manner. Yeah. Because, well, that's the producer. The, yeah. the producer found all these musicians. I didn't know any of these guys. They're all from North Carolina. And he handpicked each person and coached them, produced them, directed them in a way that I could never have done. Yeah. Um, I, I would have said things like, uh, play happier or, you know, <laughs> uh, that, that part's a little sadder or, you know, I, I would have given these it's also hard. terrible directions, but. It's also hard sometimes that musicians sometimes don't know when to back off. Yeah. Uh, and especially they'll, tr and, and this isn't by, no means a generalization, but it happens a lot. A lot of musicians will play what they consider to be the most impressive or the flashiest or the most fun to play, or yeah. I have a neat thing here, and maybe it's not time for your neat thing there. Maybe it's the song, and maybe the thing you have to play is just the most basic groove that still drives the song for three minutes and seven seconds or what have you. But to have... And it's easier when a producer does it because a producer can just say, listen, that's what you're going to do. That's what I need you to do. Yeah. And, and the and the musician doesn't resent the producer because correct. they respect them and they realize this, this, this is a pro I'm dealing with yeah. and he's produced hundreds of records. Um, he, you know, he knows more about recording and engineering yeah. and producing than, than I want to know. And I'm okay with taking direction from him versus on Cottonwood. I did a lot of the producing. Yeah. And I felt very awkward, you know, hitting the button on the mic and saying, hey, let's do that again. But on this part, can you uh, slow it down a little bit? And remember, you you fade out on that word. Yeah. And, I, you know, it was like it was like me trying to direct traffic, um, you know, without really knowing all the hand signals to yeah. direct traffic. I was yeah. that wasn't I, what I wanted, but I don't know how to yeah, tell you I, how I to get there. Well, Kyle yeah. Polk was a drummer on Cottonwood Sessions yeah. and, you know wonderful drummer and a great guy i don't think he'll ever want to work with me again because <laughs> you know he was just so frustrated with what i was trying to get across to him yeah and i felt bad i was like man you know i I'm brought this guy in and i'm basically giving him a hard time yeah and he he ended up doing a, an amazing job but it was like pulling teeth because yeah. i couldn't describe what i wanted and and he's a drummer and he's, yeah. he speaks drum sure i'm sure. a guitar player 
I don't speak drum. So it's, and you you, know. not only are you a guitar player, but you're you're a songwriter, and it's your vision. Right now, when you write songs, do you just hear what's happening? Do you just hear this guitar and vo- vocal, or do you hear the arrangement? No, I I when I write. It's strictly just for the acoustic guitar. Really? But I also know that every solid song can be bigger and and better with more instruments. Yeah. Um, just like a in a lot of songs, there's a breakdown. Uh-huh. So the song breaks down to the most rudimentary parts. You've got a basic backbeat, maybe a little rhythm, and the vocalist is taking a pause and maybe comes in with a you know something and then all the parts build back up and you know having heard rock music do that for years i realized that if you have a good solid core if you have a good skeleton you can dress it any way you want yeah and yeah. and as long as you have accomplished musicians who can hang with and i'm a, i'm a huge fan of the grateful dead i'm a huge uh, widespread panic fan and dead fan and i watched them do it live mm-hmm. which is unreal that they could you know decide to change outfits on this skeleton in the middle of the song like hey let's uh let's make it a little jazzier tonight Mm -hmm. and everybody kind of catches the oh okay that's what we're doing all right you know and they would just go with it and it would take off and develop into something usually amazing um and so i i said you know if i write a good solid song that holds up with just the voice and the guitar Later, I can imagine what instruments. And, sure. And so Doug and I sat down and, and you know, he said, well, what instruments do you think goes on this one? And I said, well, I can definitely hear pedal steel. Mm-hmm. I don't know what else, but let's write down pedal steel for this. And this one for sure fiddle. Yeah. Uh, these three have got to have drums. And from there, we just kind of, you know, fleshed it out. Now, are you are you pretty open to him saying, let's try these different directions? Oh, yeah. and? Do do they end up in a totally different place than what you were thinking about, or some some of them took a a, a turn that I didn't anticipate, but I trusted him from the get go, and I knew I had to trust him. I knew yeah. I knew it had to be a partnership. Um, you know, w- once you've chosen a producer, you know you you go with it. It's a, it's like you know you're in on that project together, and. Yeah we were going to do some Hammond B1 organ. And then the only thing that, uh, that is not on the record that was going to be was some Hammond. Uh He's got a 19, I don't know, like a 1949 or 1952 (laughs) Hammond B1, uh, vintage, uh, organ. And we were going to have some of that on it because I love the band and I love, you know, the, the clavichord and, uh, just the cool old, Ham, usually Hammond B3 is what I'm used to hearing, but right. B1 is the predecessor. And I said, man, that would be so cool to have some of that old creaky band type organ. And we never got to that. It just uh, kind of ran out of time and, and, and money and airspeed, but it's okay because next time, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's still there. Old- I have an old Hammond M1 sitting in my mom's basement back in Ohio that I just don't have room for here. Yeah. But yeah, I, I long for the day that I can have my M1 back. Uh. <laughs> well, I got to say that th- this this record, I learned a whole lot again, and I corrected a lot of the mistakes that I didn't even know were mistakes when I was making Cottonwood. Sure. And uh, I read a quote recently that I think all musicians, especially anyone listening to this podcast, needs to take to heart. And that is, as a musician, as an artist, don't ever compare yourself to other people. Only compare yourself to what you've done in the past. And if you've gotten better and grown and are making better music, that's all you need to worry about is is if you're getting better at what you do, that's all that counts. Um, you can't go around, you know, looking at everyone else and saying, well, it's not as good as theirs or it's not, you know, because you're only good at doing you're only good at being you and you're only good at, at your sound. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people are not going to like your stuff. And that's, yeah. that's just a fact of life. I mean, hell, a lot of people hate Bob Dylan. They, they despise Dylan. Sure. They're, they're like, Oh, take that off. I don't want to hear that. I, yeah. That guy's awful. And so, you know, I realized that you, you got to have the courage to really push your style to its limit. Yeah. Knowing that you're going to turn off a lot of people 
But right. the people who like it, they might really like it. So, so this record, when is uh, when's the release date? Uh, May fifteenth mm-hmm. um, is the release date, and we've got a uh, super special album release party at Coastal Coffee Roasters on June seventeenth, Friday, June seventeenth. Um, and I say super special because uh, Coastal is doing it as a special event. Uh, we're going to have three singer songwriters open up the night. Um, Josh Jarman is one of them. Um, there are two others, and uh, th- that'll be a surprise for later. But uh, then uh, Dan Riley uh, is going to have his band, and he's going to play a set. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, come up and do a couple of uh, solo acoustic numbers and then join Dan's band um, and uh, finish the night with uh, two or three that have a full band on the record. And uh, it'll be probably the only time I get to recreate that live is That's with, awesome. with Dan's band. So it's going to be a, a heck of an evening. That's awesome. Really looking forward to that. Looking forward to the record coming out. Uh, why don't you play one more song off that record before we talk about kind of a, a few more songwriting things. Okay. What do you got for us? Um, I think I wanted, for the second one, I want to do um, First Time in a Long Time. All right. First Time in a Long Time. Second date and it's getting late Lights are low like the radio Look in your eyes Says you don't want to wait But I believe we should take it slow Cause I don't want to be Mr. Right It's only just right now I don't think I should stay the night I don't think we should lay it down For the first time in a long time I just want to take my time Being with you is like hitting every green light Music up with the top down Time with you, honey, is like a pocket full of money on a Friday night heading downtown. But I don't want to be Mr. Right. It's only just right now. I don't think I should stay the night. I don't think we should lay it down for the first time in a long time. For the first time in a long time. First time in a long time, girl I just want to take my time Nothing's wrong with a little bit of chase Slow and steady for the win Girl, you know love ain't no race And only fools rush in So I don't want to be Mr. Right If it's only just right now I don't think I should stay the night I don't think we should lay it down For the first time in a long time For the first time in a long time First time in a long time, girl I just want to take my time So I don't want to be Mr. Right If it's only just right now I don't think I should stay the night I don't think I should lay down For the first time in a long time First time in a long time For the first time in a long time Girl, I just want to take my time 
I just want to take my time I just want to take my time Awesome, man. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about that one. That one is kind of funny because uh, I was feeling a little bit down about my writing. I was thinking, you know, I like what I'm doing, but I feel like I'm writing for a different era. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm writing songs that would have been, you know, radio friendly in the seventies, maybe the eighties. Um, it's a little folky, it's a little old school country. And I listen to, uh, you know, W E Z L and what's out now, what's considered country now is so different. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think, man, you know, am I writing for the wrong era? You know, am I, am I, am I doing, am I recreating something that it's had its time go by? And so I said, you know, just for fun, I, th I think I want to try to write a modern country song. Uh -huh. I want to try to so write something that could be on country radio today if it had the right production. And just as a joke, I started sort of coming up with some lyrics and I was singing them in a real, you know, over the top sort of cheesy modern, you know, rock country way, sort of, you know, mocking the lyrics as I sang <laughs> them. And uh, I actually started putting some verses together and I said, Whoa, what's, what's going on here? This was a little joke. And now it's starting to, it's almost like, uh, it didn't get the message that this is a joke. It's my brain is like, <laughs> okay, the, you want to write that way? Let's write that way. And, and I started coming up with some, some good lyrics. And I said, Whoa, Whoa, I, before this gets too, you know, too far along, I better see if, you know, if this will work with music. So I sat down with the guitar and the first, time i went through it trying to find the chords i said now nah, this is yeah this is what i thought it was this is this is terrible you know <laughs> but then i found a chord progression and a way to sing it that it i liked it and i said wow i'm really you know i never thought this would be a, a real deal um and so finishing the song i i took it seriously and said okay uh, no more of a joke this 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 has potential and i need to i need to honor this and uh so i finish the song and it's completely outside my wheelhouse or what had been my wheelhouse. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, it's the most radio friendly thing I've ever come up with. And, uh, you know, I, I think fans of modern country music would actually probably like this song and probably not like, <laughs> uh, the first two records. Uh, <laughs> um, this album is much more positive, up, beat uplifting uh energetic uh cottonwood sessions was sort of like lyrically and uh from a writing standpoint it was like really going to the depths of darkness for yeah. me yeah. um if you really listen to the words of cottonwood it, it's a very dark record it's, yeah. it's very it's very heavy it doesn't sound that way musically on most of the songs but lyrically it's it's pretty dark and uh i kind of got that out of my system and i said okay you know i've i've i've, I've gone to the, you know gone to that place and i've i've you know and i want to i want to write something different i, I don't want to write all sad songs and yeah. uh so there's really nothing on this record at all that's dark or sad or down or it's um i th i think it's pretty uplifting actually um so um, that's great, man. I can't wait to hear the entire record. Um, when it comes to your songwriting, any tried and true methods? Oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a rank amateur and I, I will never really consider myself, um, good at songwriting. I don't understand. To me, it's like magic. It's like, I don't know. I don't know how it happens or where it comes from. I just know that at the end of the day, I have a song <laughs> and I don't, I don't have a process, you know, I, 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 I just start and put the puzzle pieces together and if they work and if it fits, I'm pretty good at, at, uh, sort of finishing songs. I know a lot of people have trouble finishing. Yeah. Um, I'll get a couple of verses that I consider to be poetry. Uh huh. And if the last verse is not so 
poetic, that's okay as long as it ties it in and finishes it. Because, you know, again, you're not going to write many perfect songs. Right. Um, but it's better to put out a good song <laughs> than to not finish it. Yeah. And, uh, but no, I just, uh, I get lyrics or lines. Uh, like I was listening to the radio one day and they were interviewing a Navy SEAL and he was telling all these war stories and he said, oh, you know what they say, man, uh, bad decisions make great stories. Mm. And it, it was like lightning hit me. Bad decisions make great stories. That's a, li- that's a line. That's a lyric. And so I built a whole song around that. Uh, that was the first line of the song. Bad decisions make great stories. Sometimes one line can do all the legwork, man. Sometimes you hear one thing and everything else kind of just snaps right into place. But yeah, I, um, I don't know where songs are going. I, I, I only have one song that was written uh, with intent with, well, on this record. Uh-huh. There's only one song that I said, I want to write a love song. Um to this specific person, to my Mm -hmm. girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, this is what it's going to be. It's going to be a love song and it's going to be country. Mm -hmm. And that's the only time I've been able to sit down and know what I wanted and get there. Every, everything else sort of finds its way and becomes something. And I say, wow, I didn't know I was going to write about that, but there it is. So yeah, I don't have any, any real uh, method other than, like I said, uh, when you're in the presence of the muse, when when you're feeling it, when when it's flowing, you, you just gotta not get interrupted. You you gotta let yourself go with it. And you know, I think long distance running helped me understand the value in patience and endurance. Um, if you're feeling good and and you know you're running, go another mile. Yeah. Why not? And so when I'm riding. If it's working and I'm feeling it, I don't get up until I'm exhausted or until it's finished. Um, you know, I get in that trance and I'm like, this, this is, this is important. And I don't feel inspired most of the time, but when I do, you got to strike, you got to, you got to, uh, get what you can when you can yeah, and write it down yeah, uh, or, or record it do into you your demo phone. It? Yeah. I, I'll sing into my phone. I'll be okay. driving on the interstate singing lyrics into my uh you know uh iphone and then later go home and listen to it and say i'm so glad i did that because i can't even remember that melody and now that i hear it i'm like oh that's how i sang it you know so i'll capture stuff um immediately if it if i think it's good um are there any songs out there that you consider to be just the pinnacle of songwriting like they hit it um, uh, well, you know, it's funny. I was listening to the Danielle Howell, uh, episode and you asked her, uh, are there any perfect albums? Yeah. And when you asked her that question in my mind, I had the answer. I was like, yeah. Oh, I know, I know one. Okay. And she said the one I was thinking, Joni Mitchell's blue. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a perfect record. And every word on every song is just, just amazing. I mean, the, you know, I can't imagine it being any different, uh, but uh, for me, um, Neil Young's On the Beach mm. is a perfect record. Um, and uh, it's really inspiring because that was the most non-commercial, yeah. <laughs> non-overproduced, grungy, real. Um, you had to be a Neil Young fan, fan to love that album. And uh, all the Heart of Gold people will never hear that album. <laughs> they'll 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 get two seconds into it and be like, "Oh, this is awful." You know, I w- I want you know Heart of Gold. And uh, even Neil said that he had done that. Yeah, it was time to move on. Yeah, and he went a different direction. Um, and I, I I love that realism. I love I love that sincerity in in a lot of his stuff. If you were to make your kind of Mount Rushmore of songwriters who would be four or five songwriters. You would say, these are my guys, man. I'd, I'd have to go with, uh, of course, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Stephen Stills, Mm. um, Jim Croce, um, for his short career, um, pretty much everything he did was either super cool or profound. Um, and, and, you know, there's so many, but 
and Neil Young, Neil Young for sure. Um, and I'm sure there's a bunch I'm leaving out, but, but yeah, uh, Paul Simon, Paul Simon, uh, was a genius, uh, when it came to writing. Um, and I, I don't think I'll ever write anything even close to as good as Paul Simon, but I think I maybe someday could write something close to as good as maybe some of the other guys. But Paul Simon and Dylan are just, they're, they're too, they're too high. <laughs> they're up in a there. league of their own. Yeah, they're too high up. I'm glad you're saying, uh, things like, I think I could write songs like this because I actually quoted you at one point. You said regarding your first record, this could be it. This may be one and done. And I'm so happy that you're so happy about what you're doing. I can't wait to hear this new record. I really want to thank you for coming in today. And uh, look forward to the album. Look forward to the album release party and seeing what you're doing in the future. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed my conversation with Ron Daniel. Ron's latest album, Country Made for Kings, actually dropped today, May 15th. Uh, Check out his Facebook page. There will be a link in the show notes on where you can find that on streaming platforms. And on June 17th, there's a CD release party at Coastal Coffee Roasters in Somerville. As always, thank you for listening to Songs of the Unsung. For more info about the podcast, you can check out our website, songsoftheunsung.com, or we're on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you're a singer-songwriter, feel free to reach out to me about being on a podcast in the future. Always love meeting new singer-songwriters out there and sharing our stories and our influences and maybe catching a little bit of that songwriting mojo. We'll see you next time. Thank you, folks.